from the grill. It's the school shooting that has sparked protest out and outrage. 17 victims at Stoneman Douglas High School in Florida and a wave of protest across the nation in the week since. Students say they want action to make their schools safer, but while some politicians argue about what to do, one Valley City has taken action. Good evening, I'm political editor Dennis Welch, and this is Politics Unplugged, and that action was to add more school resource officers effective immediately, and the city of Glendale made that announcement just over a week ago, and with us to talk about about that today is school safety and more is Glendale City Manager Kevin Phelps and Police Chief Rick St. John. Thank you both for being here. Now we do know that the governor has put forward a plan to a school safety plan that does include more money for school resource officers as well as some other things. Why did you guys feel like it was important for you to move ahead right now? Well, it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, at the end, when we look at it as a value statement for our organization, is there anything more important than really protecting our students, our children, and our student, our teachers? Okay, and wh what are we talking about? Uh, my understanding was you had school resource officers in four schools uh, in Glendale, and you've expanded that to nine. Um, what it, it's been in place for a week? How's, what, what's the reception been? You know, I think the reception's been really, really good. I think the faculty, the administrators at the school, the students certainly have enjoyed having an officer on campus. I was out on one of the campuses earlier this week shaking hands with the students and talking to them. They all thought I was the school resource officer, so I introduced them to the actual officer, but everybody seems really pleased. Let's talk a little bit about the role of the school resource officer. They're not there to be like disciplinarians, are they? They're not there no. to uh, you know, help the, the schools with that. They're, more, they're there as just security, correct? Correct. So in the city of Glendale, we have a community policing philosophy, and that means building relationship with different segments of our community and the student base, the, the administration, faculty, they're certainly a big part of our community and so the school resource officer is primarily there to build relationship and interact for the police department on that campus. Okay, and this can't be cheap. Who's paying for this and how much is it going to cost? Well, it's going to be a partnership. Uh, the school districts are, are going to be putting in about 25% of the cost, um, but we've asked our organization to step up across the board to help make this a priority. So we've got a number of different strategies that we're doing to, to make sure this is an ongoing program. And is, are these going to be resource officers, like specifically, like one, uh, one officer is going to be at the school, uh, you know, in, in indefinitely, or is, there, is this like a revolving door? So the, the way we do it in Glendale is the school resource officer position is a four-year assignment. And so those officers that have taken those positions are asked to stay there for a four-year time period. And then we reassess and figure out where to go from there. Okay, and was this really the best method to move forward when you're talk, talking about school safety? Because I know a lot of the student protesters that have been demanding for more, more school safety measures, they have uh, you know some issues with that. Um, they say that maybe the, S the SRO is not the best way to move forward on this. They want more school counselors and whatnot. What do you say to them? Well, I can only speak uh, the fact that the school superintendents are, are you know really believe in the program and have told us they believe it greatly increased uh, you know safety in their schools we I think this is going to be very much like uh, what happened after 9-11 where our airports uh, started becoming safer but it never stopped it just evolves and so we think the school resource officer program is really just a first step into really looking at all of our campuses and making sure they can be safe okay now a couple of weeks ago we had some of those student protesters here on the show and I want to play a little bit of soundbite from them we already have student resource officers on campus. We don't need two million dollars more of them. Um, additionally, they are not good for um, kids of color, especially low income area, because too many times, because schools don't have enough resources, the SRO disciplines and that leads to arrests. Additionally, the majority of, um, or many shootings here in Arizona that happen in school are suicides. Just two months ago, a 14 year old boy shot himself in his school bathroom mm -hmm. in Southern Arizona. And I'll tell you right now that an SRO or an armed teacher is not gonna stop me from blowing my brains out. SROs, armed teachers don't get to the root of the problem because all these shooters are students who are suffering, who are depressed, who need help and counselors can stop it from even happening. Now, I want you to kind of respond to that. You tell, sure. you talk about the racial component here, that uh, there may be some, some cons cons concerns with minority students. What would you say to them? So we, we have minority officers that work as school resource officers, and that's part of the community policing philosophy is to look like your community. So I would respond by saying that uh, we use officers within the schools to build relationship and build an understanding of what law enforcement does. Mm -hmm. At times there may be uh, some interactions that the students don't like, 
but that's part of the learning process. Okay. Now, I wanted to ask you, why not spend money on putting more school counselors, as these students have been bringing up, uh, instead of just going uh, straight for school resource officers? Well, again, I think this is a partnership, mm -hmm. and so we do what we can do. Uh, you know, we're not in the counselor business, um, but we are in the public safety business, and we have expertise in this area. We have dedicated men and women who wear the uniform to protect our, uh, not only our campuses, but our entire citizens. So do what we're good at, which we believe uh, can, is public safety. Is, is a school, I mean, a city in any discussions maybe to uh, help fund more school, uh, like more counselors in the future? I know this is maybe a first step. Well, I think the students nationally have done a great job of raising this awareness in this conversation across the country. And as I said earlier, this our SRO program is not the end all to, to protecting our children. It is but a first step. And I think it'll be positive for our community to continue to discuss mm -hmm. what we can all do as a, as a community to ensure our safety. And what, what about other schools? We're talking about high schools now. We're talking about all nine high schools in Glendale. What about middle schools, elementary schools? Any plans for that in the future? Yes, yeah, so we implemented a school liaison program. So a school resource for high school, school liaison program for middle schools and elementary campuses. We have 51 of those campuses within the city of Glendale and they're serviced right now mm -hmm. by three officers. We're looking at in increasing that program with a fourth officer. Any, any specific training then uh, that the, these SRs are going to have to go through or have been through? So uh, they've gone through mental health awareness and crisis intervention training. Uh, and then, of course, they go through the tactical training that all officers go through. Okay. And what are the districts saying? Uh, any other districts? What are you hearing from them since the shooting and since you've put in this plan? Again, I've talked just to the leadership from all four of our school districts, and and they have been very, very positive, um, and and have, and been encouraging. I have not talked to other school districts here in the valley, um, but uh, I think we would be very happy if we became a catalyst for that discussion. And now, in another topic of conversation, we start talking about securing schools and whatnot. Is the idea of arming teachers? And I'd just like to ask you, as a law, a law enforcement professional, mm -hmm. what do you think about that idea? So I don't think it's practical, to be honest with you, from a practical standpoint, putting guns on campuses requires measures and metrics in place to protect how those guns are used which means you got to train the people that are carrying them you got to qualify with them annually at least and then you've got to armor those weapons to make sure they're in good working order and I think the cost alone for the the schools it just makes it not a practical step for them to take yeah and what have you been hearing from districts any other ideas that they anything else they want from the city to help them to secure their schools They've hadn't, they haven't had any specific ask of Glendale at this time, but again, I think with our SRO program, uh, it helps us stay engaged in the conversation, and uh, certainly if there's some things we can continue to do, um, as I said earlier, protecting our children has to be a top priority, so whatever that conversation is, we'll see what we can do to help make that a reality. All right, well, thanks for stopping by. We've got to take a quick break right now, but we do have more Politics Unplugged just ahead up next. Water and power, we take a look at what it is ahead for the Navajo Generating Plan. And national Republicans turn their gaze to Arizona's 8th District 8 race, a closer look at why some say the party is worried about this reliably red stronghold here on Politics Unplugged. Right here. I want to talk to you. Well, I want to talk to you. are a part of life, but they don't have to tear apart your life. If you're hurt in a wreck, you don't want to get half your injuries treated, half your car fixed, or half the money you deserve. Call us now, and we'll help make you whole again. Call 977 no
Honda SUVs are on sale for up to $3,805 less than the competition. HRVs $189 a month, full-size pilots $289 a month. Or fill your garage with Motor Trends SUV of the Year, CRV, or Ridgeline, a car and driver 10 best. Every SUV is on sale from $189 a month at your Valley Honda dealers. There's a new Burlington opening in your neighborhood. I love the jewelry. Everything for the home. Blouses, dresses, shoes and socks. I love the kids' stuff. Strollers, jackets. All the great brands at a fraction of the cost. Hurry in and save. is a highly charged controversy what to do with the Navajo generating plant. The coal-fired plant is a lifeline for the Navajo reservation, but a lightning rod for proponents of clean energy. But now it's also at the center of a battle over water, and that is tonight's hot topic. Welcome back to Politics Unplugged, and joining us now to talk about the Navajo generating plant and its planned closure is former Arizona Congressman John Shattuck. Thank you very much for being here. And first of all, maybe explain some of the controversy here to us. Uh, you know, what's the deal with this? Why are people so upset? Well, as you said, uh, it's a hot topic. In Arizona for years, if you look at political leaders, they've said, you know, Whiskey's for drinking, water's for fighting. Mm -hmm. And this is a fight over water, not over electricity. Uh, and it's a fight perhaps over coal. Uh, Arizona won a lawsuit entitling it to a huge amount of Colorado River water. It went, case went to the United States Supreme Court twice, mm -hmm. and we're entitled to that water. We built the Central Arizona project to bring that water to Phoenix and Tucson. And now, some in Arizona want to close the power plant that supplies the electricity to move that water. They claim that closing the plant will somehow save money because the price of natural gas dipped mm -hmm. for a span of less than a year, uh, and therefore we should close the plant and be done with it. Uh, in point of fact, uh, it was, I think, a one-time drop in the price of natural gas, and there are lots of reasons not mm -hmm. to close the plant. Number one, water rates will go up. Number two, uh, the availability or the certainty of water prices will vary dramatically. You look at the cost of natural gas in any kind of a chart, and it does this. You look at the cost of coal power and it's fairly mm -hmm. flat. And the other thing that will happen is that uh, property taxes imposed by the Central Arizona Water Conservation District on everybody in the Phoenix area, the Central Arizona, sure. those property taxes will have to be raised. Now, it, it, obviously, it, it seems like there is a big push to move the country away from using so much coal. It's been naturally doing that now for, gener for, de for decades. Any ways to convert this uh, Navajo generating plant into something that's more clean energy use? I think there are lots of ways to look at that issue. One of the problems with the proposal on the table is that it is so sudden. Uh, all the way up through December of 2016, the owners of the plant were saying, we're going to keep it and we're going to operate it to the end of its useful life. That's another 26 years. And then on a dime, they turned and said, no, we not only want out of it, we want to bulldoze mm -hmm. the place. We want it gone. Um, I think one of the things that nobody is looking at is that the price of natural gas has already come up 60% since it hit its low point. Mm -hmm. The studies that each side rely upon, at least some of them say, we'll know within as little as two more years whether uh, coal will stay more expensive uh, and it would be better to close the plant or yeah, natural uh, gas well, is the way to go. Yeah, I was going to say, like, is it, you know, it, right now, natural gas, you mentioned a, an increase in price, but it's still cheaper than coal right now. And wouldn't that give uh, that plant more stability moving forward in the future? The, the key words are right now. Uh, the answer is, if you actually had that chart here, it would show there was a dip that spanned a handful of months. The other thing that people don't think about is that you not only want that power to be as low a cost as it can be, but you also need it to be stable. You can't convince Intel to move a plant here to Arizona if the price of water is X today and 4X or 5X tomorrow, and then a day later it's back down to 1X, and then a month later it's back up to 6X. And that's what happens with natural gas prices. The other problem with natural gas is that we have to bring it into the state by a pipeline. It's not like coal where we have our own supply and an extra stock in a pile beside the plant. If that pipeline goes down, we could lose the power from a natural gas plant 
all together and be in a real fix to move that water in. And Another reason the price becomes unstable. Now, you'd mentioned that the CAP, the Central Arizona Project Plants, has uh, stopped using power from uh, the plant to move water. Now, is this a question you believe that's more has to do with economics or politics here? I, I think it's clearly politics. Okay. Um, Explain the, that. Well, the board there is like a lot of Americans. They want to get rid of coal. But the thing that shows that it's politics is it, the price of natural gas dipped for a handful of months, and their answer is close the plant immediately. Nobody with uh, the millions or tens of millions invested in a plant like Navajo Generating Station would close it based on one year's experience. What you do is say, well, let's see if we can make it more efficient, and a lot of that is being done by uh, the Navajo Nation and the plant and the coal plant itself. Uh, but on top of that, you'd look and say, well, is this a one-time dip in natural gas prices or are natural gas prices going to stay low forever? I would argue that natural gas dipped because of fracking and that if it stays low, we're going to start exporting natural gas mm -hmm. through these liquid natural gas plants and onto ships. And when we do that, the price of natural gas is going to do what it always does, which is go back up and then probably go back to fluctuating. All right, and a uh, final question here for this segment. Uh, what do you think this is all, how is, it, how is this all going to play out? What's the, what's the end game here? What do you think is going to happen to that plan? Well, the interesting thing is that this was a promise Arizona made to the federal government to repay the debt. Secretary Zinke, uh, who has the responsibility for the Navajo people, is looking at not only is this a false premise that natural gas will stay forever, stay low forever, but also of the devastating impact that will happen to northern Arizona. It would wipe out two-thirds or more, maybe three-fourths of the Hopi's operating budget. It will wipe out almost half of the Navajo's operating budget. I think Secretary Zinke is saying, whoa, slow down here. I mean, I don't see any reason not to extend the operation of the plant for, say, four years. If it's a loser in the long run, fine, close it. But I don't think that it is. I think the evidence will show it is a stable and inexpensive source. It saved the state uh, over a billion dollars since 2001. It'll save another $370 million from now until 2030. And again, that was former Arizona Congressman John Shattuck, who joined us last week for that segment. And we do have more politics unplugged just ahead up next. The court ruling that could cost the state hundreds of millions of dollars in education funding. And it all centers on Proposition 123 approved by voters two years ago. We'll take a closer look at that just ahead. Back in bigger than ever, the fifth annual Phoenix Bike Fest roars into the Peoria Sports Complex April 12th through 15th. Experience the four-day celebration of everything motorcycle and riding in the Southwest. Admission is free. Check out phoenixbikefest.com for more info or follow us on Facebook. Hi, I'm Ron Hess from the new East Phoenix Window Depot at 44th Street in McDowell. If you're looking for new windows and doors, the Window Depot is your one-stop Phoenix warehouse. At the Window Depot, we have Phoenix area's largest selection of in-stock vinyl windows and interior and exterior doors at the Valley's best prices. The Window Depot is now your choice for kitchen cabinets and granite countertops. Come in today. Our prices can't be beat. The Window Depot. Windows, doors, and now cabinets. Car wreck? Check. Motorcycle wreck? Check. Truck wreck? Check. Bicycle wreck? Check. UFO wreck? What? In a wreck, you need a check. Call Learner Road now for a free consultation. Call 977-1900. Express Flooring has some exciting news. One call to Express Flooring and we'll bring samples of carpet, tile, wood, laminate, and vinyl plank to your home on your schedule. It's extremely simple, fast, and free. Just announced extreme savings for Easter. Get up to 73% off new flooring, all backed by our free lifetime installation warranty. Plus, call Express before Easter and pay no interest until 2020. Express is the best. He was passionate about his barbecue sauce. People would coax and bribe, but even his wife didn't know what was in it. After 68 years of keeping it a secret, his final wish was to share his recipe. Now his spicy legacy will live on. Only a Dignity Memorial professional can celebrate a life like no other. Find out how at DignityPhoenix.com. More and more people are finding themselves in a Chevrolet for the first time. Trying something new can be exciting, empowering, downright exhilarating. See for yourself. 
why Chevrolet is the most awarded and fastest growing brand the last four years overall. Switch into a new Chevy now. Current select competitive owners and lessees can get $4,500 total cash allowance on most Malibu models when you purchase. Find new roads at your local Chevy dealer. Welcome back to Politics Unplugged. It is now time to talk it out with our partners from First Strategic with us today, Kirk Davis and Marcus Del Artino. Let's start with this issue of gun safety. We saw in the first segment, uh, Glendale came here and talked about their move to put more school resource officers on school campuses, which begs the question, how come we haven't seen anything from the governor in terms of legislation? It's been a couple of weeks uh, since he has rolled out this idea, outlined his plan for school safety. It, not nothing, Marcus. They're down there working the votes right now uh, as we speak on this plan. And, and that's what they've been busy doing. I mean, look, you, this is, you've got to put together a strategy and a plan, and that's what they are in the middle of doing right now. They're trying to figure out if they've got 16 and 31, um, and it's going to take some work. There's no doubt about it. Things like school resource officers and counselors, I think, are layup shots. I think you can get to 16 and 31. There are some concerns about the seizure. Uh, there is some seizure provisions in there on weapons. I know that concerns some of the more conservative yeah. members. Uh, the Republican Party, um, and there's some uh, issues on the left. They want um, background checks, bump stock, um, more gun legislation than having to do with school safety. Yeah, is this going to get to the uh, to the finish line? Is the governor going to get this? Yes. Yeah, I think. Oh, he... explain because it seems to me <laughs> that he has taken it from both sides. As Marcus just pointed out, I mean, Democrats are saying that they're not going to go for it if it doesn't include st stronger background checks. You know, and, 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 and the gun, gun rights groups down there, like the Citizens Defense League, they say they haven't seen the legislation right now, but what they're hearing, they don't like it at all. Sure. And again, I think you're seeing the two extremes on the issue. Mm -hmm. The art of the deal is in the middle on this. Well, how much middle is there at this legislature I, anymore? I think there's comfortably enough votes within both caucuses to put a coalition together. It's not going to have everything that everybody wants, but it will be a step forward on the school safety issue. As, as mentioned by your previous guests, this issue evolves and people are, you know, it's going to be, this is a long slog. Mm -hmm. And so this is just the beginning of that slog. Okay, let's stick with schools right now. There's a big court ruling. Um, federal judge ruled that Proposition 123, a payment that was made, was illegal, um, unconstitutional because it uh, threatened the harm and the growth of the state land trust. How big of a deal is this? They're still trying to figure out if the state is going to be on the hook for some $400 million or whatnot. Um, how big of a deal is this, Marcus? I think if the decision was two years ago, it would have been a big deal. I think today it's not a big deal, and here's why. One is Congress has already acted on this provision and said it's okay. So that part of the ruling is taken that, care of. That but fix was just made a few weeks ago, it, two years after the what voters. I just said if it was two <laughs> years ago, it would be a big deal. I said now it's not a big deal. Um, so that to that point, what the judge is now saying, saying is, okay, Congress did fix this, so moving forward, you're okay. In retrospect, does that cover the two years? And that's the new court battle that's going to go on. But what I think is interesting about this case is the plaintiff in the case um, is actually said, look, I don't want to take money away from schools. I was just interested in doing the right thing, doing it by by the book of law. And I think that he may have more influence uh -oh. in this, this case. This judge is going to change this ruling dramatically. There, he, there's no proof of harm by for this individual who was who who filed suit. Except the state land trust belongs to the citizens exactly. of Arizona. And so anybody really can have standing. And 500,000 people in Arizona mm -hmm. said we want to do things differently on behalf of the schools. Well, Je I just want to play this to you because State Treasurer Jeff DeWitt, outgoing State Treasurer Jeff DeWitt, warned about this very thing two years ago. Let's play a little bit of what he had to say. I would suspect we will see many, many more lawsuits that are similar. Congress already has been very clear that it takes more than just voter approval to do this, it takes congressional approval. Should and the governor have been listening to the state, the, the state treasurer back then. Should they have made this fix two years ago before, you Absolutely know? not. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, we'd still be sitting there talking about it, and we would have, you know, we'd have rainbows and, and unicorns flopping around on this issue. But he, the governor did exactly right. The voters followed through, and Congress, as usual, followed after the people. How can you say you did it exactly right if a federal judge is saying you did it wrong? One federal judge said it was wrong, and I guarantee you that this ruling is going to change dramatically. Congress did take action. 
this issue really is not is a non-issue. And Ducey, he probably should have known a little bit more about the state land trust or known better because he was the treasurer who oversees that land trust. Yeah, but you have to realize that the governor has a legitimate uh, disagreement with the treasurer over this. Yeah. He has a different interpretation of the law, which is what courtrooms are designed to do, okay. is to settle that difference, and that's exactly what took place. There's also a reason and, and, it's called state trust land, not federal trust land, state trust land. Yeah, which, Those are our lands to make our decisions as Arizona. Yeah, but it was given to the states under certain provisions by the federal government in which a federal judge ruled like, hey, you didn't follow and the those Congress provisions. Said, no, we actually agree with what the state did. Okay, well, let's move on. <laughs> Want to know what this means politically now for the governor. It seems like he has taken it really on all fronts. Uh, teachers are upset with him right now uh, with the lack of pay. you got the Prop 123 ruling. And now you've got this Uber uh, issue that has cre crept up. You have that uh, tragic death of that woman who was hit by one of those autonomous driverless vehicles out there. Does this leave the uh, governor vulnerable heading into an election year? Well, look, you can't say that right now because we're in the middle of the legislative session. I think you can make that judgment when legislative do sessions over and the bills get signed. But that being said, if this budget gets negotiated and teachers do get a pay raise and a significant pay raise, more than 1%, um, and school safety gets signed, um, mm -hmm. I think you can make an argument that he's in, he's in good shape. But a lot of that depends on revenue coming in, um, what the books look like, if you can afford these raises, um, and two, if um, school safety passes. Now, is the governor going to pony up more money here? Because we're talking about a 2% raise phase in over two years, 1% this year, 1% next year. Teachers are upset. They want 20%. And the governor uh, told me, told uh, in a press, a press gaggle uh, on, fr on Thursday, he said he is sticking with his original plan. Well, remember, his original plan and what he's executed on is every year that he's been governor, there has been additional funding for K-12. You can't do it all in one year. The, the, you can't just make money. So you, there has to be a plan. He is executed on that plan every year. Do I think there'll be alterations between the legislature and him on the fine on this final plan for this year? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, you can't make money, but however, he continues to cut money every year. He's been cutting, uh, you know, cutting taxes. How we does that this, look? We had this discussion last. Well. I guess it was a couple of weeks ago now. And yeah. the fact of the matter is these tax cuts have not been ver very significant. I mean, last year, um, I think it was to uh, keep the cost of inflation up on uh, personal income on your personal income brackets. Sure. Uh, this one's uh, for a veterans uh, issue. It, they, are, they are tax cuts, there's no doubt about it, but very small. Okay, and also the, the, the governor played well when we asked him about, uh, about teacher pay. He started arguing that we're not 49th, we're not 50th. He actually said we're 43rd, and I think his exact quote was, I'm not bragging that we're 43rd, I'm just saying we're not last. Yeah, no, it's a tough play. Look, the last couple of weeks is those days when you're governor, when you wake up and say, I really took this job for the high pay and all the great benefits that come with it. It's, it's been tough. Okay. That's the hard part about being governor. The question is, and I think is being demonstrated, is how you lead your way out of these weeks. And I'm pretty confident he will lead himself out very well. Okay, I want to head over to the uh, this Congressional District 8 race uh, over there. It's pretty interesting that it uh, looks like uh, national money has been coming in from the Republican side to help Debbie Lesko go out there. Is this something that signals that this race may be more competitive than people think it is? I think it signals that they want to put this race behind them as fast as possible. They want a 10-point lead, a 15-point lead. They certainly want to be in double digits as soon as humanly possible. Mm -hmm. And they think that that saves them resources as in, in the long term. But it's going to be closer spend than it has been. Now, so you don't have to yeah. spend a lot later. But this is at least going to be closer, more competitive than prior years. I would concur with that. Yeah. I think the biggest reason you're seeing the money, Dennis, is that it allows them to define Debbie Lesko versus being defined by your opponent. All right. Well, that is all the time we have this week for Politics Unplugged. Be sure to join us next week for more Politics Unplugged. Good night.